Welcome to Social Allo Ministries, where we are committed to glorifying God while exposing the devil. First, I want to say, do you notice the resemblance between me and basically me in the background? And the painting in the background, I've mentioned before, and that was a period where I went through living hell on earth. I'm going to cover some of that today. But I also wanted to talk about there are times when you're going through hell on earth and you're wondering, you're asking the Lord, why me? Or why did you let that happen to me? Or even, where were you, God, when that was going on? I have mentioned Job and that he was a righteous man. Yet he was afflicted by the devil on two occasions, despite his righteousness. But this one here is a little bit different. It's about when we either ignore or did not hear the Lord's warnings. There's some warnings that are general. For example, the Ten Commandments. In 2 Samuel 11, David was tempted and he ended up coming in adultery. That resulted to a murder, a violation of at least two of the Ten Commandments. So in a sense, David had been warned before he committed those acts. Once he violated the Ten Commandments, then the Lord stepped in. In 2 Samuel 12, the Lord sent his prophet Nathan to rebuke David, to let him know that uh, you sinned and you're, now you're going to pay the price. And then the prophet told David that he was going to suffer immensely. And that is exactly what happened. And David's life started unraveling later on in 2 Samuel 12, 2 Samuel 13, even his family was affected. His warning came via the Ten Commandments. Something David knew, but he violated it anyhow. One of the first times that humankind fell out of grace with the Lord happened in the Garden of Eden. But the Lord gave Adam a warning, and Eve received a warning also, regarding the one thing they should avoid doing. And in Genesis 2, verses 16 through 17, it states, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may eatest, thou, may, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That was the Lord warning him. Of all the trees in the Garden of Eden, he can eat from all of them, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was, a, that was a stern warning. The Lord let him know that he was going to die. Now, there are times when we receive a warning from the Lord, and we don't truly understand the magnitude of that warning. When Adam heard the Lord say that he was going to die, Think of it, you're hearing about death for the first time. It's kind of like, what is it? I have no concept of what death is. And even if he was told what death was, he probably still had no true concept of it. Because there's some times when you literally have to go through hell in order to get a full appreciation for it. But the Lord warned him. In Genesis 3, we see how the serpent, the devil, seduced Eve and got her to violate that same commandment that the Lord had given to Adam. And it was something that Eve was aware of. We see that in Genesis 3. They were warned beforehand, but they did not follow the Lord's instructions. And they paid a price. They paid a price. Then we see something happening with their offspring. Cain and Abel. So in Genesis 2, the Lord warns Adam and Eve what not to do. In Genesis 3, they did what the Lord warned them not to do. And then in Genesis 4, we see the story of Cain and Abel, two brothers. And the Lord gave a warning also. The Lord gave a warning also. And this warning, it applies to us. It applies to us. In Genesis 4, verses 6 through 13. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? 
And why is thy countenance fallen? And this is the warning for Cain, and it applies to us today. This is one of those reasons why there are times when we suffer and we wonder why we had to go through it. The suffering is not always immediate, but if we um, look back in time, we'll realize that we're paying the price for disobeying the Lord. He warned us. So in verse 7, the Lord told Cain, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin life at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So the Lord told Cain that sin was crouching at his door, but he must rule over it. In fact, it even says it, mentioned about him. Basically meaning the devil was knocking on his door. And a part of this stemmed from Cain was jealous of his brother because the Lord had accepted Abel's um, sacrifice to him. But he did not accept Cain's sacrifice. And as a result of that jealousy, it opened the window for sin to enter into him. We have to be careful that we're focused on the right things. Not being jealous, not being prideful. When it comes to sin, it kind of comes from three sources. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Those three things. You can, you can lump sin into one of those three categories. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So even though the Lord warned him, Cain killed his brother. He allowed sin to get the better of him. And it is written that we should submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. But if you don't resist the devil, he's going to hang around. And the devil is like a hitchhiker. But the thing is, if you pick him up, eventually he's going to be driving the vehicle. And not only is he going to be driving, you're going to end up in the backseat and eventually you're going to end up in the trunk. You're going to have no control because the devil is going to be in control. So don't stop to pick him up. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> <laughs> you will see throughout the Bible, throughout history, where someone will do something wrong and the Lord will ask a question, even though he already knows the answer. <laughs> but Cain gave, um, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't have a laugh. <laughs> oh. There are times when the Lord may ask you a question, and you know you know that He knows. <laughs> but please, <laughs> don't come back with an answer like Cain did. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, you don't get to see much, but um, I can be silly, and there are times when I'll go through things when, in a sense, I should be crying, but I'm laughing. Oh, am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> Do not disrespect the Lord. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. There is nothing you can do that the Lord isn't aware of. There is nothing you can do to cover up your sins to hide them from the Lord. Here it knows. So when he confronts you, you may as well come clean. You may as well come clean. But the Lord said, And now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield <laughs> it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be 
in the earth. The Lord doesn't play. He will warn you. He will give you opportunities to stop what you're doing. But if you refuse and you want to go down the path, He will let you go. But there will come a time when if you insist and He gives a warning and you want to keep on going, then you're letting Him know, like it or not, that you're willing to pay the price. That you're willing to pay the price. <laughs> oh, excuse me. But you may not like that price. You may not like it. In verse 13, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. When the Lord takes his time to warn you, especially when he warns you clearly, and you choose to ignore the warning, you're telling him that you're willing to pay the price. You're telling him you're willing to go through hell. So Cain said unto him, unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Too late. Behold, thou hast driven me out of out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. Now he's talking about from his from the Lord that his face will be hid. The same thing happened after, or a similar thing happened after Adam and Eve sinned. They realized they were naked. They le used leaves to cover themselves. They started hiding from each other, and they started hiding from God. So sin, it took away the transparency that they had in their relationship. And it took away the transparency that they had in their relationship with the Lord. That's when they start covering things up. Not a good thing for a relationship. You need to be transparent. Or at least you should. He said, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. So he just report or repeat what the Lord said. So now he gets that the Lord is serious. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And I'll pause there. So now Cain was truly realizing the magnitude of his sins. He wasn't really in a position to say, okay, Lord, where were you? Because the Lord clearly warned him. And I'm going to share a little bit of my experiences with you. And I've kind of shared some in the past. That painting has a name, but I could also call it Three Days in Hell. The three darkest days of my life. I can't think of another point in my life lower than when I went through something in 2015. And there are things the Lord will share with me. When I was going through those three very dark days, I kind of knew something was coming up. And I kept on seeking the Lord, asking him if it was his will. But I never got what I could conclusively say was a clear answer from him, whether yay or nay. But there were things that he showed me, things that I didn't fully understand at the time. And in a sense, when I was taking the final steps to go down the path that was going to lead me basically straight to hell, for those three days, I remember walking up some steps and looking up to heaven, waiting for the Lord to say something in a loud voice saying like, stop, that's enough. And it wasn't that I was tempting the Lord, because some of you have been through situations where you literally, you are tempting the Lord. And you end up suffering immensely because of this or because of it. But in my case, I wasn't tempting the Lord. I was actually being misled. And quite frankly, it was as a result of witchcraft. But I remember walking up some steps, making those final steps where life as I knew it was about to come to an end. And I was, I was waiting for the Lord to tell me to stop. And what I was being asked to do at the time, or being told to do basically, 
It reminded me of what happened in Genesis 22. I thought I was going through a test similar to Abraham. And in Genesis 22, that was when, when the Lord told Abraham to sacrifice his beloved son, Isaac. And it's kind of like, whoa! The Lord promised Abraham that through Isaac, he would be blessed. And then he wanted him to kill him. And I kind of went through something similar where I thought my dreams were going to come true. I kind of feel like Joseph. Where in Genesis 37, he had a dream where people were going to be bowing down to him. But then he ended up spending the next 13 years in slavery and in prison. And when he was in prison, he interpreted dreams for Pharaoh's cupbearer and the baker. When a cupbearer was about to get released, Joseph thought that his trial was about to come to an end, but he ended up staying in prison for another two years. I kind of felt that way. Well, I kind of felt like my breakthrough was about to come, but a breakthrough turned to a breakdown and it resulted in the three darkest days of my life. So as I was taking those final steps, seeing if I was truly in God's will or not, went for the Lord to intervene, thinking about maybe this is going to be like um, in Genesis 22, when the Lord told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And I'll turn to Genesis 22, and I'll read from verses 9 through 12. From 9 to 12. Like I mentioned, the Lord had gave me some, the Lord had let me know what he wanted me to do and basically what he didn't want me to do. But I wasn't receiving those messages clearly. What I wanted was something like what Abraham got. And you have to be in tune with the Lord because there are times when you may be about to lose your life and you're thinking you're going to hear this loud voice out of the sky telling you to stop or give you some kind of directions. When even though the situation is dire, the Lord's warnings may not come through quite that strongly. So you have to be in tune with the Lord as far as what he is saying. And starting in verse 9 of Genesis 22. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. In my story, I was actually the one on the altar about to get sacrificed. I'll continue. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called on him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. See, that's what I was kind of expecting when I was on the altar about to get sacrificed. Went for the Lord to say, No, that's enough. I'll continue. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. When I was on the altar, I thought that I was laying down everything for the Lord, doing things according to his will. And because I was doing things according to his will, that he was going to say, stop. If he said stop, I certainly didn't hear it. And as a result of that, I ended up spending three days basically in hell. Hell on earth. In verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. See, that's what I thought. By being placed on the altar, being a sacrificial lamb, that Lord's going to say, no, stop. Here's the ram in the bush, so to speak. But like I said, if the Lord had said stop at the point in time, I didn't hear it. 
and it certainly wasn't a loud thunderous voice from the heavens. There are times when you're going on a sinful path. You have to sometimes listen for the still, still quiet voice of the Lord. In some cases, it may be supernatural events where certain things don't function as well as they normally would. <laughs> the Lord will warn us in different ways, but we truly have to heed His warnings. If not, we may end up spending time in hell. Now for me, there was no um, no ram in the bush. I ended up being the one on the altar. And I started wondering, but at first I was in shock that the Lord didn't stop and it's kind of like, uh oh, what have I gotten into? And at a point in time, the devil thought he had me and it looked very grim. I say on the first day, I was just in utter shock, felt numb. This continued through the second day. But on the third day, on the third day, I remember me, a grown man, I locked myself in my bathroom. Not only was I crying out to the Lord, I had tears in my eyes because regardless of what is written in John 3.16 about God loving the world and sending His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should have everlasting life. I didn't feel that love. I would say that's probably the furthest I've ever felt away from the Lord in my life. Because I felt as if, if I had truly done what the Lord wanted me to do, and for me to be in that awful position, that the Lord must have certainly hated me. In Manu it's written, where the Lord said, Jacob he loved, but Esau he hated. And at the point in time, I was crying out to the Lord, and I was saying, basically, Lord, if this is your will, you must hate me. <laughs> but a few minutes later, breakthrough came. Breakthrough came. And at that point in time, was when the Lord made it abundantly clear that I had been deceived and where I was, was not where he wanted me to be. But I was still in hell. And the question was, how in the world was I going to get out? Because I was going to have to cut some people out of my life. And I'll give an example. There are some of you who have been in abusive relationships. You may be in an abusive relationship right now, but every time you try to get out, that person sweet talks you into doing what your gut is telling you to do, like to leave. And then you end up in a bad situation and you stay there for a while, basically trapped in hell, seemingly unable to get out. And sometimes you may say to the Lord, Lord, I need a way out. And basically he's telling you that I have given you a way out several times. Every time you've felt a check in your stomach, every time you've had the urge to leave, and you gave the enemy an opportunity to suck you back in, you have not listened to me. When the Lord gives you an opportunity to get out of hell, even if it means leaving everything that you have behind and running for the border, so to speak, get out of hell. Yes. When you leave, that person or they are going to try to suck you back in. And they may try to make things seem better than they were, or that things in the future will be better. But when the Lord gives you the opportunity to get out of hell, <laughs> run like hell. Run. Do not look back. When the Lord gave me the opportunity to get out of hell, 
there had to be a plan in action. How to do it without enemy detecting my plan, my movement. Because like I say, there was some witchcraft involved. But this is one of the ways where the Lord shows his love. And some of you may have experienced this type of love where the Lord gets you out of what seemed like an impossible situation. I had to endure several more hours in hell. But I knew, and the Lord knew, that I was determined to get out of it. Because I knew at that point in time that I was out of the Lord's will. Now in Romans 8.28, we were told that all things work together for the good of those who love Him. So even when we make mistakes, the Lord will still use those things to our benefit. Apart from what has shaped my ministry, those three days in hell, and knowing that I don't ever want a repeat of something like that in my life, and I don't want to see anyone else go through anything like that in my life. <laughs> when the Lord gives an opportunity to escape, don't look back. And if you're honest with yourself, if you have gotten into a sticky, sticky situation, if you're honest with yourself, you will see the warnings that you either did not hear or ignored. The warnings from the Lord that you either did not hear or you ignored. And I don't say that to hold it against you. I'm saying that so that you don't hold it against the Lord. There are times when the Lord will basically select you for a difficult assignment. But when you go through it, you will come out a different person, a warrior for the Lord. But even then, there may be some kind of warning. The Lord is always with you. As long as you haven't actually died and been condemned to the actual hell, if you're going through hell on earth, the Lord can get you out. Jonah, because of his disobedience, he spent three days in a dark place, in the belly of a whale. But he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord got him out. And the Lord can get you out too. The Lord can get you out too. Do not let the devil deceive you into thinking that you are his, that you are in a covenant with him and you cannot leave. The Lord paid a price. In John 3.16, where it talks about whosoever believeth on, on him, Jesus, he paid the price on Calvary for you. In Genesis 22, when Abraham took Isaac to Mount Moriah, that was around the same location where Christ was crucified. The Lord did not have Abraham kill Isaac but his willingness to do that was a demonstration of how much he loved the Lord. And the Lord blessed him for it. The sacrificial ram on that day was a foreshadow of Christ. The Lamb of God who was slain for our sins. The perfect atonement for our sins. So regardless of where you are right now, regardless of the sin you may have committed, or even if the devil ensnared you, and in a sense it wasn't your fault, you can always reach out to the Lord. Even if you willingly got into a covenant with the devil, Jesus paid the price to get you out, if you'll only cry out to him. You don't have to be like me, a grown man locked in a bathroom, saying, Lord, you must hate me in order for me to do this. But at least for what I did, it was a demonstration. It was a demonstration that I was willing to give up everything for the Lord.
But even while I was going through that, I kind of wondered, what did I do to deserve this? And you may be wondering that sometimes. What did you do to deserve whatever it is you are going through or have gone through? Sometimes, yes, you may have done something, but the Lord is merciful. So even if you're getting what you deserve, cry out to him. Repent. Repent. He loves you enough to get you out of hell on earth. In John 11, we see that Jesus tarried while Lazarus was about to die. But even though he died, Jesus resurrected him from the dead. Jesus snatched Lazarus from the grip of death. He will do the same for you. So again, it doesn't matter what you got into or even how you got there, the Lord can get you out. Jesus paid the price. And even if you were like me, feeling as if the situation that you got in, even if you feel as if the Lord must have hate you, must hate you for you being in that situation, that is not the case. That is not the case. Even if you don't know, the Lord is with you. Because whenever I reflect on my three days in, in hell, basically, I see the Lord is with me. I know that things could have been, oh, so much worse. And it would have been even worse if I had been left there even longer. Didn't give a lot of details, but I'll just let you know, the Lord is faithful. He's full of grace. And probably most of all, whether you believe it or not, He loves you.